this on? Is that on? Is that on? Is it on? Welcome. It's good to see each one of you. My name is Dave Rhodes. I've, some of you maybe have started coming to church uh, since I was last year. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not an intruder. I actually go to church here too. So uh, it's really awesome to see you and uh, for us to be together uh, in the worship and praise of God today. Wow, how, how fast the summer has gone, right? Yeah, already uh, September 1. Really, and um, a conclusion to, I think, a great uh, summer in the Psalms, and I uh, just enjoyed uh, all of the different speakers that we've had this summer, and just the uh, flavor and the flair, and um, I hear last Sunday was just absolutely wonderful. I thought I, I would uh, go play the piano for you right now. Uh, <laughs> no, but thank you, um, all of you who showed uh, some of the ways in which you uh, give praise and worship to God through uh, your talents and, um, you know, through your gifting. What a special time. So here we are, just uh, talking about finding our way. You know, I had a wonderful thing happen uh, on Friday. I got a text from a, a pastor at one of the churches in Puyallup and saying, our church is praying for your church this Sunday. Is there any requests that you have? And I, I think that's really an awesome offer because you know that uh, in the Puyallup region, there are many churches that are united together in prayer. And uh, the pastors are, we're just, we're tight. <laughs> we pray for each other. We talk to each other like this. We say, isn't it good to be on staff with each other? Because there is really, all, although there are a lot of different like tribes, there's really one church. And we're trying to make a huge impact for the kingdom of God. So I just want to give a shout out and a thanks to Chapel Church uh, Today, who is praying for us. And I thought it'd be great for us to pray blessing back upon them today. Wouldn't it be honest, awesome to do? So, Lord, thank you so much for Chapel Church. And we pray that uh, your great power, the Holy Spirit, uh, in person, would just uh, speak to them and come upon their service today as they worship you, upon their individual lives. We pray that you would meet all of their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And we pray that they would find themselves more and more in love with you, just like we also desire for ourselves that we might give you our very lives. We, we would offer to you ourselves, you as the only true and worthy Lord. We give you praise for this in Christ's name. Amen. So I'll, I'll just give a few little uh, pastoral encouragements, okay? So next week, we're, we're starting back up with uh, two services. <laughs> I really meant just two. But two services, 9 o'clock and 1045. And here's what I want to encourage you. Let's don't be passive. Let's don't be lackadaisical about it. Let's be right here. Let's be ready to go, right? Let's just turn now the momentum and the encouragement of these uh, past Sundays as we've worshipped as, as uh, kind of one. Let's just turn this into just some ready to go uh, into the 9 o'clock and also the 1045 service. And so I just want to encourage you, like if... Unless you are having, like, children and other things like that, sometimes that, you know, all of this gets in, you know, it's hard to always be on time. But I want to encourage you. We have, like, limited time, like, uh, only a little over an hour and 15 minutes out of the entire week that we are together. Uh, of all these hours, we just take this one hour where we're worshiping together. And so I want to encourage you just to make the most of it. Uh, did you know that when visitors come to a church, they are on time. Did you know that? And so when, I, it's just, a, this is not a dig, although if you want to take it like that, you can, right? But this is more like on time. And so when they show up and there's eight people here, they go, oh, I thought there was going to be church here today. Wouldn't it be great if there was like 100, 150, 200 people already present? So I just want to encourage you in that, okay? Because that, that's a way of, of showing our hospitality and also a way of showing our anticipation that we are going to meet with God and that we expect that God is going to meet with us and we just want to be in on it from the very beginning. So I encourage you uh, to do that. Um, I also just want to uh, give a shout out to the Malawi team, our team that went to Malawi, Africa, got, got back last night after a very long plane ride. Anybody here from the Malawi team, you want to stand up? Uh, anybody actually make it to church? <laughs> Okay, uh, there are, there are, thank you so much, and we'll be hearing more about this trip. There are others who are also here, but they're lying down in their seat, because it was like 
and an exhausting uh, trip home. But I know just great word along the way of the impact for Christ in Malawi. The wells that were dedicated, the uh, VBSs that were held, the children that came to know Christ, uh, the church building completed. So uh, just really, really exciting. So we give, we give praise to God for that. I was on, um, the last two Sundays, I was on a ride, a motorcycle ride, which you know I like to take from time to time. Uh, I took off with Lee Evans from our congregation, and we rode to Cody, Wyoming, where we met my brother who was coming from Kansas City. And then uh, we, uh, we had this awesome trip, right? We go, we go west to east through Yellowstone, uh, met my brother, then we went over Beartooth Pass, and then down north to south through Yellowstone, and then we went through the Tetons, and then we eventually went into the back mountains of Utah, you know, those high mountains behind Utah or Salt Lake City, and then on down to Bryce Canyon, uh, the arches um, to Durango and over the Million Dollar Highway, which if you do it at night, it's not as scary if you don't know what's there. <laughs> if you do it during the day, you can't believe you ever did it at night, which we did. Uh, the Million Dollar Highway, it's called, and then uh, up there, up, up, up through just some great, great ride. And then finally picked up my grandson in... Uh, Boise, and then uh, Lee and I took for a ride, him for a ride up into Canada and back down. 4,900 miles. 4,900 miles. And uh, probably less than 100 of it was on the interstate. So it was really an awesome ride. We saw places and things we wouldn't normally have ever, ever seen. And um, you'll have to go with us sometime. It was absolutely uh, stunning to see the creation of God, uh, just to see, like, the, the mighty mountains. We can't believe how much we rode above 6,000 feet uh, over passes that were close to 11,000 feet. Yeah, and it was just an uh, incredible, incredible ride. Um, we were uh, riding on one occasion uh, back from Red Lodge, my brother and I, uh, before Lee was able to catch up with us after a flat tire. Uh, but um, Red Lodge, Montana, and we were riding back, and we were on this very kind of a, you know, high, kind of a high part of the, of the ride. And, and as we look out, you just absolutely see no inhabitants whatsoever. It's just grasslands, and it's just like there are no signs of life anywhere. Anywhere. Like no towns, no, like, it was just beautiful desolation. And then there was this one sign that somebody put in the road just right there real purposefully, and the sign simply said, you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Yeah. I thought that was really funny. And sometimes in finding our way and, and making our way through life and through all the things that we face, the challenges, the the surprises, the, the unexpected, the, the disappointments, the, the, you know, the, uh, the hurt. In, in the midst of every, everything that, um, that we're facing, we come across these signs that, that say something like that, almost there. And we go, this is crazy. <laughs> we're not almost there, right? And so I'm going to read a psalm to you this morning that will tell you something about God that many times you're going to read this psalm in the midst of your life as it is, not as you wish it were, your life as it is with all of its disappointments and challenges. Uh, you're going to read this psalm and it's going to feel like that sign. It's going to feel like that sign that says almost there. And you're going to have a tendency to say, oh, this is a joke, right? This is a joke. Uh, we're not almost there. Um, in fact, there was a little town hidden down in the valley not far away. So we were almost there. But it's not what you may have anticipated if you only had the view uh, of that grand desolation. So this, the psalm is Psalm 121. 
And we're gonna, I'm going to read out a couple of different uh, translations. And one is going to be out of the New International Version. I'd like to read first. And then out of the message uh, paraphrase. But it's just, uh, it's one of these psalms, I think, that help orient us in life and ground us in the faithfulness of God. And I want to tell you that what you read here about the faithfulness of God can be at any moment on your journey count, completely counterintuitive. It just, it just, it, it's not what you would normally conclude, right? Because you're experiencing some raw, difficult, challenging circumstances. So the psalm goes like this. Hear the word of the Lord. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Amen. That, that would be a statement of faith. That would be a declaration many times of what is true but is un, unseen. The Lord, he is like this, and he will do this for you. The message translation reads it this way. If it shows up, let's see what's happening here. I'm having a glitch. I'll read the message translation in a moment when we come back to it. So this is a psalm of the ascent. Psalms of ascent, songs of ascent. I think Tom talked about that a little bit. These psalms from 120 uh, through, uh, I think, 135, these psalms are songs that were sung as pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem. They were coming from all over the place, uh, scattered to the nations in many cases. And they're making their way back to Jerusalem in order to spend time on special feast days to worship God. It was a commitment. It was intentional. It was an incredible journey. It was fearful. It had all kinds of obstacles in the way, but they were committed to it. They set out on this journey. And so it's called the Song of Ascent. And it is for those who are setting out on the journey to God. And we can say that these psalms have become for us a metaphor of what it means to commit your life to God to give yourself fully and wholly over to Jesus Christ. And in giving yourself fully and wholly over to Jesus Christ, you are, you are then uh, risking, you are risking something. This is about what people do who have decided to go to Jerusalem, okay? And I'll prompt the next slide. Just go ahead and put that next uh, statement up. Thank you. Okay, we'll forget that then. So, then, and this, this simply means this. That the people who had decided to go to Jerusalem to worship God had decided to risk their lives to get to the place of worship. All right? So my question for you is just simply this. What are you willing to risk in your life to experience experience more of God. There are a lot of people who hold things really tight and close and, and safely, right? In fact, who, 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 uh, who isn't in favor of a little more religion, right? <laughs> and who isn't in favor of uh, a little things that can help, uh, you know, yourself improve your life and, and all and make things better for yourself, but but really, when it comes down to it, who is there that is willing to risk their lives for more of God? To lay all on the line. To say, I'm willing to, to move into the mountainous region 
and go through all of the peril that is suggested there in order to get to this place where I am connecting with and knowing God more fully and more deeply. Uh, it's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful question, I think. You see, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, then it is uh, upon you, this call is upon you to, to let it all go and with both hands, and with a whole heart to reach out and grasp hold of the purposes of God for you. The question for many of us, is Jesus only a help to fulfill my desires for my life? Or do I have a picture of my relationship with him being this, that I am yielding my life fully to him so that I can fulfill his desires for my life? It's the difference between simply inviting Jesus into your life or on the other hand, giving your life fully over to Jesus Christ. And then it's, it's a big difference. It's, it's a huge difference, right? Because on the one hand, what we end up with, if it's only about Jesus making my life better, then I only end up with a life as big as I can make it with maybe a little bit of God's help along the way, right? A little comfort along the way. Or it's about living a larger, grander vision of my life by giving my life into the purpose that God has for me. And I will tell you, oh, there's no story like the story of following fully after the heart of God. So here's the question. Are you like these people or not who are willing, even though there's fear, to actually set their hearts toward pilgrimage, toward the journey, toward learning more of God and experiencing more of him? So the psalm begins like this. I lift my eyes to the hills. I lift my eyes to the hills. I lift my eyes to the mountains. I look, I look to the mountains. So what is he saying by that? As he, as he says those words, what he is saying on the one hand is uh, when I look at the mountains ahead, I go, oh my goodness, I know this is not going to be easy. <laughs> I know there are going to be challenges. So the pilgrim that would have uh, been leaving from some exiled place, some foreign land, come, to come to Jerusalem would have passed through a place that where they would have encountered uh, weather, they would have encountered uh, <coughs> wild animals, they would have encountered um, robbers and thieves, right? I think it's the same thing, right? But we'll put them in two different categories, right? No, they would have encountered people that would want to do them harm, they would have encountered fatigue. They would have encountered all kinds of things that are difficult for them, right? They would have encountered themselves in the long journey. It dawned on me in this uh, long motorcycle ride, if you don't mind me using some of my own present experience to illustrate, that if you set out on a really long ride, all of your riding weaknesses will be revealed. Okay? Your riding weaknesses will be revealed. Um, you, you will, it will be revealed, your weakness in terms of attentiveness, right? Or the weakness that it could come in terms of, uh, of, making, uh, of riding slowly, right? With, with a, a grandson on your bike who the last time you took him, he weighed... 120 pounds, and now he weighs 170 pounds, right? And, uh, and, and you, you, you will be, you'll be tested, right? I mean, your weaknesses will be revealed in the, in the long haul. That's kind of like what you face in the mountain, in the long journey of your life. Like, all right, look, if, if you're married, uh, if you're married for the long haul, all your weaknesses are going to be exposed. Isn't that a happy thought? No, it's good. I, before I got married, I thought I was really a good communicator. <laughs> and then I got married. Um, before I, I got married, I, I didn't think I was very selfish. And then I realized, oh my goodness, <laughs> there are levels of selfishness in me I didn't even know was there, right? If, if you're a long haul, right, if you commit to the long haul, your weaknesses will be exposed. That's okay. That's okay. Sometimes that's what's in the mountains, right? So I look to the mountains. I look at the mountains. I look at what's before me, right? Sometimes, like, when you commit to a ministry, you commit to group life for the long haul, guess what? 
the weaknesses of one another will be exposed, but that's okay because, you know, it's just, it's, it's the way we grow. It's the way in which the sanctifying work of God goes more deeply within our lives. When, when we get revealed and we realize, oh my goodness, I need God's grace here. I'm inadequate here. I, I've lost sense of my identity here in this place. I'm, I'm still looking at my performance as a measure of my, of my worth. And, you know, all these things get revealed along the way. Um, there's, there's, there's another very interesting uh, contextual issue uh, in this psalm that uh, perhaps will, would escape your attention, and, and that is that I, I, I look to the mountains. Where does my help come from? So if they were traveling through pagan territory, if they were moving you know, from where they had been living and they were coming back to Jerusalem to worship God, then along the way in the hills, they would have passed by many shrines of worship to the Baals, to the fertility gods, to the gods that were erected by men in order to somehow, you know, get the blessing of the gods down upon them so that their journey could be safe or their crops would produce or their lives would be better. And so he says, as I, you know, I look to the mountains and I see all of that false hope and false help. Where does my help come from? From that? Of course, we don't have like, you know, bales and, you know, uh, idols like that. But we, have, but we have our own, don't we? <laughs> we have our own. Like, do I, do I look to, where does my help come? Does my help come from my education? Does it come from my position? Does it come from, you know, my popularity, the friends? Does it come from the money I have, the possessions I own, you know? Uh, does it come, where does my help come from? Does it, does it come from, you know, my... my um, a substance, you know, that sort of makes me feel better and helps me get through it? Does it come from, from lust and sex and all these other, is it all coming? You know, where does my help come from? How am I going to get through this, right? And sometimes there, there's exposed in us these cravings, these longings that are really a longing for God, but we try to satisfy them with something so much less, something that promises much and delivers little, right? And so... The psalmist would say here, I look to the mountains. I look to the mountains on the one hand. Man, this is going to be a challenge, right? But I'm committed. I'm going. I look to the mountains. There's going to be all kinds of other help offered. Where does my help come from? That becomes the question then. And so he answers it. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord. Oh, it's kind of like he has his own soul talk, right? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He, he, um, he brings his own uh, fears um, to confront what is true. My help comes from the faithful, unfailing Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You see these mountains? Uh, they may be tough sometimes, but I tell you what, I... I, my help comes from the God who made mountains. He is solid. He is creative. I love how it just calls upon the creative ability of God. No matter what I'm going through, my help comes from the God who is creative, who has tremendous ability. He, he is for me. He is not against me. Uh, I can look to him. He is my covenant God. That's what the Lord means. Like, I don't know if we all understand this, but like, there's just God that's used in scriptures like God, and sometimes and this refers to our one true God, but this God has a name, and his name is Yahweh. His name is and is translated the Lord. And a lot of uh, versions of the Bible, the the word Lord will be be all capitals, right? So whenever you see it printed in all capitals, even if it's a a, a, a big capital L and and smaller L O R D. Uh, but it's all caps. That's referring to God's, the name God gave himself. Moses said, who, who should I say is sending me? Who should I say uh, to the people who are in bondage in Egypt? Who should I say is sending me? You know, what is your name? And he says, I am who I am. And that's translated into Yahweh or the Lord. I am the Lord. I'm, that's my name, right? And I'm, I'm giving you my name. And, and so when it says, who will help me? 
the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the Lord who has given me and given us his name, the Lord who has promised that he's always going to be faithful. He's not going to, he's not going to forget us. He's not going to fall asleep on us. In fact, as you go all, all the way through this, you will, you will understand it, this as he says this. Uh, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. This is the Lord. Oh, when you say his name, does it mean anything? Or is it just like an address, like, yeah, dear Lord, <laughs> right? But who is my help? Who's my helper? Who's going, who's going to help me in this, in this journey to God, to, in giving my life, risking all, giving my life fully over to God, who's going to help me in this? The Lord. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has given us his name, Right? The one who will not abandon us. There's a, and I'm probably going to lose the PowerPoint a little bit at this point because I've lost all my ability to read notes, so I'm going by what I remember of the message. I'm so glad I studied this. Okay. Um, he will not let your foot slip. Really? Are you kidding me? He will not let your foot slip? Now, are we, is this, now this is, is this him? Because I've wrecked on my motorcycle, and I've fallen down a lot of times, and I've had all kinds of mishaps, and I have a boatload of failures in my life, and I, I have had, I've had, I've been forgiven so many sins, and I, and he will not let your foot slip. Now, what does that mean? Later on, it says, he will watch over your life. Really? He will watch over your life. This, this is why I said at the beginning, this psalm is counterintuitive. Like that sign that says, almost there, right? But this is like, so is, are we going to believe this? Is, how do we believe this? And that's what you're going to have to ask with a lot of scriptures that declare these grand, broad, sweeping statements about the faithfulness of God. You're going to have to figure out how to work this into your life. What does it mean to be a person of faith at this point, faith in this very truth that is being spoken? I, I believe that, just to help, just to give you some hint about this, he will not let your foot slip. This does not mean that, that there's not going to be any failure along the way. Okay? It does mean this. Remember what you have set your heart to. You have set your heart to the pursuit and knowledge of God. You, you, you've set your life in the direction of God to know Him. All right? Now, th this, is, this, is not, this is not a psalm for people who just have their goals. Right? This, this is a psalm for people who have set their hearts to know God. It's very important to understand this. Because a lot of us in American consumer Christianity want to take the scriptures as a way of supporting our own agenda in our lives. But in fact, this is about the pursuit of God. So as you set your heart to pursue God, one thing that God is going to do is he is going, even in the midst of the failures and struggles and the learning how to walk, he, it doesn't say you won't still have to learn how to walk, but he is saying he is going to be there. He's going to be attentive. He's, going to let, he's not going to let these, uh, these dangers and this slippage be fatal in your life. He is going to help you walk. I like that. I like that. The God who watches over you will not slumber. And he doesn't go to sleep. I love this. God is not passive. 
He's not passive. You set your heart toward him, and God is all over it. <laughs> he is not passive. He's not going to go to sleep. He's not going to lay down. He's not going to get tired of you. Yeah. That tragic event that happened recently, uh, you know, in, in the east or in the south where the woman was drowning, remember, in her car, and the dispatcher became upset with her and began to say, well, I guess this will teach you, you know, not to uh, drive in the rain. Uh, she, was, uh, she was delivering papers, and, uh, and uh, shortly after, uh, she just, the dispatcher got so irritated with this woman's, you know, cry for help and, and all that she just, you know, kind of lost all compassion, and the woman ended up drowning and dying. Um, God's not like that. <laughs> you, should sh you should be glad. <laughs> God is not like that. God is, God is going to stick with you. God is going to walk you through it. God is going to talk you through it. He's going he's to help you make it through the mountains, right? And get to that place and know him more on the journey. God is not passive. He is not absent. He is not forgetful. He is watchful. He will watch over you. You're coming and you're going. Uh, I, I think, yeah, let's, let's read this. That's perfect. I, I think I have three. <laughs> now go back, go back, go back one more time. Okay, good. We're going to do, go back. There you go. Here we go. All right, let's read this. All right, this is the message. Isn't this fun this morning? It's totally flying by the seat of my pants. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Let's read this. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep. Not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke and sheltering you from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. Amen. So praise the Lord, right? Those are the words. You can take that to the bank. You can build your life on that. It's counterintuitive. Are you going to believe only your experience? Or are you going to believe God's word? This is really important. If you believe only your current minimal experience, at any given moment on the difficult journey, your God, you will size him down and you will make him small and the narrative of your life will become all about you. But if you believe God's word, if you take to heart this psalm, and if you struggle and wrestle in the midst of all of the mountain trauma and you look to God for your help, you'll discover him to be amazing. To be amazing. In a way, the psalm is saying God is not passive, so don't you be passive, right? God is active. God is engaged. So you, let us, let us as his people be engaged and active. And let us experience a God story in our lives that when it's all said and done, we could write a psalm to. Amen? All right, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, I want to give you a hint about a little bit that we're going to cover at the, uh, at the uh, prayer invitational for Thursday night. Uh, I'm just going to give you a hint about this, and we're, then we're going to walk through it. But uh, here are prayers for the journey. Prayers for the journey that make a big difference within, can make a huge difference within how you walk then with God, okay? So you may want to write these down, all right? And then, and then start practicing them. And if you come then on Thursday night, we're going to really pray these over our own lives, but also over the church because they're, just, they're huge, okay? So a number of years ago, I've, God just like opened the door for me to discover and, and just kind of come kind of into an, uh, these prayers of the journey that have been prayed so many times in my own life and made a huge, huge, huge difference. The first prayer of the journey is simply this. Abba, I belong to you. Okay, would you say that with me? 
Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba is the uh, familial and close, intimate name of God, Papa God, our Father, where we say to him, Abba, I belong to you. There's just no better thing in the world than to know that you belong to God, that your identity is in him, that he loves you. Abba, I belong to you. Say it with me. Abba, I belong to you. Sometimes you just need to pray that on the journey, right? The next prayer is this. Come, Lord Jesus. Say it with me. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. It's like the man whose servant or child was dying, and he says to Jesus, Lord, come, you know, come. My child is sick. Come, Lord Jesus. It's the invitation. It's the prayer of invitation where we invite Jesus in to every detail of our lives, even our struggling lives, our relationships where it's hard, where there's disappointment, we say, come, Lord Jesus. Say it with me. Come, Lord Jesus. The next prayer is this. I surrender to you. Say it with me. I surrender to you. This is the prayer of relinquishment. This is where we learn to say to God, loose grip God on all this and firm grip on you. I surrender to you. My kingdom go, your kingdom come. I surrender to you. This prayer of relinquishment is perhaps the most important. It's, a, it's a, like a central prayer in the life of Jesus, right? I surrender to you. Would you say that with me? I surrender to you. The next prayer is this. Set my love in order. Say it with me. Set my love in order. This is the prayer of alignment. This is the prayer of willingness to walk and step with the Holy Spirit of God. This, this is the prayer that helps us center in the character of Jesus Christ. Set my love in order. My love toward you. My love toward others. The, the proper love I'm to have for myself. Set my love love and order. Say it with me. Set my love in order. The next prayer is this. I trust you. Say it with me. I trust you. This, this is the prayer of, uh, of just that kind of, of raw, in your face, I'm going to trust God no matter what's going on, right? I, I trust you. This means that I put the full weight of my life down upon you. This means that before I have clarity, I will put my trust in you. Right? I trust you. Would you say it with me? I trust you. And the last prayer of the journey of these uh, six prayers is this. You are enough. Say it with me. You are enough. This is the prayer of sufficiency. That God is completely and fully sufficient for everything that you're facing. No matter what it is, God is sufficient. This, this is so important to understand. Otherwise, you'll be looking to the gods that are represented in the hills around you and in the culture around you, always trying to find help here and help there. And, you know, rather than just simply going for what your soul longs for, which is to know God and to find rest and sufficiency and power in Him. Amen. After a little bit, after the children have joined us, after a greeting time, we're going to share together in communion. We've done this now, the fifth Sunday in a row, having communion. It's not our norm, but we really wanted to do that this summer. Here's what I want to challenge you to. Would you be willing to say to God, I'm willing to, to set out on this journey to know you. I'm willing to risk everything to know you. Because you risked everything to save me. Amen? Everything. And make this moment of communion, I'll revisit this in a few moments, but make this moment of communion a time of 
the surrender of your life to knowing God and to knowing him more fully. 24-7, 365, all the time, come what may. He is worthy. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you. Oh, you're awesome. Thank you for the blessed hope that you've given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that you have not left any of us out. And thank you that you will not forget us. But you will guard our way. And we will arrive into greater dimensions of our relationship with you and in our love for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.